This week marks the 60th anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Council, a council used to justify so many of the changes we've seen during the reign of Pope Francis. What was the original intention of the council? And why does Vatican II remain so deeply contested in the Catholic Church today? Joining me now to discuss this and much more, senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center and author of the new book, To Sanctify the World, The Vital Legacy of Vatican II, George Weichel joins us. George, thanks for being here. In your introduction, you write that, quote, the second ecumenical council of the Vatican, Vatican II, in the familiar shorthand, was the most important event in the history of Catholicism since the Council of Trent responded to the various Protestant reformations of the 16th century. How so, George? Raymond, Vatican II was the Church's attempt to reckon with a new situation, a modern world that had become simply irreligious, not pagan. Paganism is full of religiosity, however odd or crazy. The modern world was becoming increasingly irreligious, and the wiser spirits in the Catholic Church, including Pope St. John XXIII, knew that the Church had to rekindle its Christ-centered faith in order to respond to that with a new sense of evangelical urgency and missionary energy. Yeah, it, it was a pastoral council, though. How is that more important than the ones that preceded it, that touched on doctrine and uh, to clean up heresies? I mean, those were pretty weighty and important councils as well. I think this distinction between a doctrinal council and a pastoral council is ill-judged, Raymond, and I don't even use it in the book. Uh, Vatican II no, had issued two dogmatic constitutions, one of which affirmed the reality and binding authority of divine revelation over time, which is precisely what is at issue in Germany today, and the second on the Church offered both Catholics and the entire world a richer doctrinal view of what the Catholic Church is. So there was serious teaching at Vatican II. George, in his opening address, uh, Pope John XXIII, when he opened the Council, um, said that its greatest concern must be the more effective and complete presentation of, quote, the sacred deposit of Christian doctrine. How did the documents, uh, Deo Verbum, uh, Lumen Gentium, how did they address that challenge? That opening address of John the Twenty-Thirds is, I believe, the best prism through which to read the entire Council. Uh, we speak about interpreting the Constitution of the United States through its original intention or original meaning. It's important mm -hmm. to understand what the original intention of John the Twenty-Third was for the Council in order to understand its documents. And the original intention was not so much to change the Church as to Christify the world. And to do that, the Church had to evolve, develop its way of proclaiming the gospel, but it was the same gospel. And the notion that uh, the Second Vatican Council was summoned to reinvent the Catholic Church is both a fundamental misunderstanding of what councils do and a very bad misunderstanding of the solid doctrinal teaching of the Constitution on Divine Revelation, God does speak to the world and we can hear that word, and the teaching of the dogmatic Constitution on the Church, Lumen Gentium. The Church is the template, or as the Council put it, the sacrament of the unity of the human race. Mm. If it was so definitive, Vatican II I'm talking about, and so seismic, George, why are we seeing these debates over core doctrinal issues that we're seeing today? Why are we seeing them continuing into 60 years later? Uh, those debates, Raymond, as you and I have discussed, I think, on several occasions before, actually mm -hmm. began within the Second Vatican Council itself. And they reflected divisions within both the episcopate and, and also uh, in a very sharp way within the world of Catholic theology. The important point to grasp today, I think, is that the living parts of the world church, 
whether we're talking about in North America or Sub-Saharan Africa or what shoots of life there are in the church in Western Europe or Latin America, the living parts of the world church are those that have embraced the authoritative interpretation of Vatican II by John Paul II and Benedict XVI, and the dying parts of the world church, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, mm. et cetera, are the ones who are still trying to make this failed project of Catholic light, reinvented Catholicism mm. work. Catholic light leads to Catholic zero. That's the empirical fact that should uh, mm. drive this conversation into the future. Yeah, and I want to get back to that in a moment, because that's a crucial point you make about the spirit of Vatican II and the letter, and then the, the, the definitions under the last two pontificates. But regarding the liturgy, George, in your book, you write, in the liturgy, the Council Fathers argued the Church was most itself, and the experience of liturgy ought to be, brought more directly into the Church's theological self-understanding. A renewed, liturgically centered and vibrant Church would, the liturgical movement's leaders believed, both deepen the conversion of the Church's people of Christ and help bring the leaven of the gospel to the world. Did it work, George? I'm not talking about the letter of the documents, which call for the preservation of the Latin and uh, pride of place for Gregorian chant, but did the reformation of the liturgy, if you will, have the intended effect? It's had the intended effect in the living parts of the world church, but we certainly went through a silly season in which a lack of liturgical discipline really eviscerated the intention of the Council in calling for an organic liturgical reform that had already begun in the 1950s. The Second Vatican Council did not invent the idea of an ev evolved, reformed Roman rite. Pius XII began that process with the reform of the Holy Week liturgy in the 1950s. Uh, I think today we're coming back to center, although I regard the recent decree from Rome, Traditionis Custodes, as a serious mistake because the availability of the older right was helping the newer right become more what the Second Vatican Council intended it to be. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say we're a holier people today? I mean, how did the shape of the Constitution on sacred liturgy? Um, uh, 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 why do you why do you think it didn't take hold? I guess is the better way to frame this. The, because the, when you read it today, George, it's so clear. Uh, it, it, they want more participation, but they didn't mean for a dislocation of the Mass, and certainly not a suppression of the Latin Mass, which we're hearing from Rome today. Raymond, I, my view is that a lot of our traditionalist friends are a bit too pessimistic about all of this. Uh, I see holiness all around me in my parish uh, every Sunday. Uh, I see holiness whenever I attend Mass throughout the world. Uh, the sacraments have immense power, and we should remember that, even as we mourn the reduction of too many expressions of the liturgy into mm -hmm. the self-expression of the celebrant. That was the single biggest mistake in the implementation of the Council's Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, putting the priest's personality at the center of the liturgy. That never was the intention. The liturgy has its own integrity and its own personality mm. of which priest celebrants are the servant. Mm. I, I want to play something for you, George. Back in 2003, I interviewed our friend, uh, theologian Cardinal Avery Dulles and Archbishop Philip Hannon. Uh, Archbishop Hannon was, of course, present at the council. Uh, Cardinal Dulles was certainly a contemporary of it and a theologian at the time. And I asked Cardinal Dulles what the impact of the liturgical changes of Vatican II were on the people. Listen to this. Well, I think uh, the document is fine uh, mm -hmm. on the, the Constitution, the letter, on the sure. liturgy. If people just read that and observed it, uh, there would be really no problem. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there was a tendency to read it uh, in a way that uh, said the only thing is the sacramental liturgy, 
and everything else uh, should be kind of dismissed. Mm -hmm. And so private devotions, for example, suddenly disappeared and evaporated. Mm -hmm. uh, things that were really nourishing the uh, devotion of the faithful. So things that were slightly marginalized, perhaps, by Vatican II, were suddenly excluded in the name of the council, which they never mm -hmm. intended. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, everything was reduced to a minimum and uh, the uh, 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 liturgy was somehow interpreted as though it were a kind of a celebration of community mm -hmm. rather than adoration of, of God. And, and, and George, really, this remains the challenge at the heart of the faith today. Community, you know, focus on the community rather than adoration of God in liturgy, including the suppression of the old Latin rite, sort of pitting the traditional against the current. I think one of the signs of vitality in the church today, Raymond, 60 years after the opening of the council, is the return of those devotional practices amplified by newer devotional practices that my old friend Cardinal Dulles mentioned in your interview. Mm -hmm. The enormous impact of the Divine Mercy devotion on uh, renewing parish life in the United States is, is one example of that. There's a lot more uh, devotion to the rosary today than I think there was 40 or 50 uh, years ago. The revival of Eucharistic adoration, uh, even in very yeah. tough neighborhoods, in the, in the old cathedral, the Basilica in Baltimore, which is in uh, the middle of a very distressed city, there is now 24-7 Eucharistic adoration. This is, yeah. this is a recovery of exactly what Cardinal Dulles was lamenting properly, the loss of in the immediate post-conciliar period. Yeah, yeah, and Mother Angelica, our own Mother Angelica, had a big hand in all of that, sort of keeping those popular devotions popular, George, that had fallen out of practice. And people thought, oh, they don't do this anymore. She said, oh, no, no, not only do we do it, we do it regularly and we're going to do it in a big way, which I think was an important sort of cultural standard to plant early on. Uh, on Tuesday, Pope Francis presided over a special evening mass to commemorate the opening of the Second Vatican Council 60 years ago. In his homily, he praised the council for having, quote, rediscovered the living river of tradition without remaining mired in traditions. Yet let us be careful. Both the progressivism that lines up behind the world and the traditionalism or looking backwards that longs for a bygone world are not evidence of love, but of infidelity. Now, George, I, I get how progressivism by its nature lacks fidelity to establish doctrine. But how does traditionalism bespeak infidelity? Uh, it's unclear to me, Raymond, exactly what the Holy Father meant there. It's unclear to me what he means on several occasions. Um, I come back to the brilliant statement of another old friend, Cardinal Francis George, in his mm. uh, first press conference when he became Archbishop of Chicago. And, of course, the guy from the Sun-Times or the Tribune or whatever pops up and says, are you a liberal or a conservative? And Cardinal George, who was probably the smartest Catholic bishop in the history of the United States, said the Catholic yeah. Church is not about left or right. It's about true and false. And it would have been useful, it seems to me, to lift that up in Rome on the 60th anniversary of the opening of a council, which, as you rightly noted at the beginning, John the 23rd wanted to celebrate as an affirmation of the Church's sacred deposit of faith and a rekindling of the Church's Christ-centered faith in order to get on with evangelizing the world. Yeah. The Pope also blamed, uh, Pope Francis, blamed the temptation to choose sides in an ideological battle on the devil who wants to sow the scandal of division. He said, how often in the wake of the council did Christians prefer to choose sides in the church, not realizing they were breaking their mother's heart? How many times did they prefer to cheer on their own party rather than being servants of all, to be progressive or conservative rather than being brothers and sisters, to be on the right or the left rather than with Jesus? Let us overcome all polarization and preserve our communion, end quote. 
But what do you make of that, given what we see happening in the church today, George? It's, it's a noble sentiment, and I certainly share it. Uh, I do think there's an awful lot of siloing uh, in, in the church today, but that, that is not uh, helped. That problem of siloing is not resolved or solved by the kind of action that we saw from the Holy See last year in respect of the celebration of the traditional Latin Mass. Why are we punishing people who are going to Mass when the single biggest practical pastoral issue facing the church around the world after the pandemic is getting people back to Mass? This just really doesn't make a lot of sense. No. Uh, I, I want to play something else for you. This is Archbishop Hannon on Vatican II. And this is how uh, the, the Archbishop explained the failure of the laity to embrace the teaching of Vatican II. Listen to this. Basically, uh, I don't think that John, Pope John XXIII thought that this was going to be such an enormous thing. Sixteen documents. Mm -hmm. Now, and each one of them is very, very weighty. We did not have any time to teach the people because all of a sudden at the end, 1965, everything was supposed to go into effect. Uh, and it was impossible to instruct the people in all these changes. Mm. And that's the reason why, in my opinion, there was this great deal of turmoil. Now, George, you argue in your book the Second Vatican Council was never meant to rupture Catholic doctrine, only to better communicate the unchanging uh, Catholic truths, and that the Church was in the middle of a civilizational crisis. Looking back, though, is the Catholic Church any more relevant today than it was before Vatican II? Uh, I, so, Archbishop Haddon makes, makes a good point there. Uh, there was a rush to implementation that I think, in retrospect, was very mm -hmm. ill-advised. Uh, the Archbishop of Krakow, Karol Wojtyla, led a nine-year implementation process in his diocese before he became Pope John Paul II, and nothing was done for four years, while thousands of discussion groups around the diocese, this is under communism, mind you, read the documents right. of Vatican II with the help of a guide provided by the Archbishop. That was not done sufficiently, really, just about any place else. I think, Raymond, the Church has, in the documents of the Second Vatican Council, its teaching that Jesus Christ review, reveals both the face of the Father of mercies and the truth about our humanity, in its teaching that the Church is a sacrament of the unity of the human race, uh, has developed a message that this postmodern world desperately needs to hear. So, yes, I mm. think the Council's teaching is even more relevant today in a world yeah. of trans ideology and all the rest of it. Yeah. George, the stats are pretty grim when you look at 60 years later in the Catholic Church. Ordinations are down, attendance is down, uh, frequenting the sacraments are down. Uh, Ross Douthat, in a recent piece in the New York Times, says the, it was important to sort of retool the faith in the 1960s, but, quote, the Second Vatican Council failed on the terms, on it, on the terms its own supporters set. It was supposed to make the church more dynamic, more attractive to modern people, more evangelistic, less closed off and stale and self-referential. It did none of these things. The church declined everywhere in the developed world after Vatican II, under conservative and liberal popes alike. But the decline was swiftest where the council's influence was the strongest. And then he goes on to talk about the new liturgy that was supposed to engage the people, and that was a, a, a failure, too. Your take on that? analysis. I, I think it's just wrong, Raymond. Um, I think Why? Ross is right uh, about the necessity of the Council, but he's just misreading the global Catholic scene. There are hundreds of millions of new Catholics in sub-Saharan Africa thanks to Vatican II, a point I made in the Wall Street Journal a week and a half ago. There are vibrant Catholic campus ministries all over the United States today that are expressions of Vatican II. The places where the church crashed and burned are either, one, places like Quebec and Ireland, where there was a deep resistance to the council, 
and then modernity simply washed over those places and washed the church away, or as in Western Europe, where the council was misinterpreted as an invitation to reinvent Catholicism as a new form of liberal Protestantism, which has worked nowhere mm. in the world. So I think Ross well, is just George, wrong. Yeah, well, this is, the, I mean, what you just said, that uh, there were some who interpreted the council as an invitation to turn the Catholic Church into variations of, of, of Protestantism. Last week, the Vatican Synod, the Twitter page, tweeted out the following. Now, this is from Cardinal Mario Gresh. He is the secretary general of the Synod of Bishops, uh, about to reexamine everything anew in the upcoming year. He said, quote, a correct reception of the council's ecclesiology is activating such fruitful processes as to open up scenarios that not even the council had imagined and in which the action of the spirit that guides the church is made manifest. George, this seems awfully like what you were just saying. This is a—and the problem is it's not just Eastern Europe. It's the seat of Catholicism. It's Rome embracing the spirit of Vatican II and basically saying everything's up for grabs. Well, everything isn't up for grabs, Raymond, and that was a singularly unfortunate statement from, from Cardinal Grech. Uh, and it's a misinterpretation of the Council. Uh, in a very, very severe way. Um, this synodal, synodality talk is too often a cover for advancing the Catholic light project. And I think it needs to be called out for that. If we are going to have a genuine discussion about the Catholic future in October of next year, let's look at where the Council has been successfully implemented where there is vibrant evangelization going on, where there are living religious orders. Let's not take Germany as a template for the church of the future, because it manifestly is not. Uh, George, in your book, you write, and I think correctly, um, that Popes John Paul II and Benedict XVI, both major figures present at the Council itself, that they provided the authoritative keys of understanding Vatican II in that 35-year period after the Council. What were the keys to understanding Vatican II, and does the current hierarchy of the Church agree with you? The master key, as I suggested in, in the book, was, the, was provided by the Extraordinary Senate of 1985, which said the Church is a communion of disciples in mission. Friendship with the Lord Jesus is the beginning of the Church. The body of Christ exists for mission in the world. If you read the documents of the, Vatican, of the Second Vatican Council through that lens, you get the living parts of the world Church. I think most of the episcopate of the Church today, certainly in the living parts of the world Church, uh, has grasped that and is getting on with what John Paul II uh, called the new evangelization. But I am not prepared to read the Catholic future through the demise of Catholicism in Northwestern Europe. That is just a fundamental mm -hmm. mistake, nor am I prepared to take that, and particularly this German synodal way, which is a complete mm -hmm. fraud in terms of uh, actual yeah. serious theological discussion, as a template for the mm -hmm. universal church. That just cannot happen in October of 2023 well, in Rome. Well, well, George, when I read your book, and again, you are, you are trying to properly situate the Vatican Council, not only historically, but in the theological evolution as, as seen, as you said, the keys to understanding it were furnished by the last two popes, that 35-year span. But it seems we're almost trying to edit that out now and pretend that the Holy Spirit was not operable for the last 35 years through the prophetic teachings of John Paul II and Benedict XVI. The liturgical understanding is being trashed, uh, John Paul's moral teaching trashed, and Cardinal Mueller last week called it a hermeneutic of rupture, what we're seeing today. Is it? Yeah, I think Cardinal Mueller was right in picking up that phrase of, of Pope Benedict XVI. But again, let's not read the entire world Catholic reality through the prism of what's going on in Rome today. Rome is not the sum total of the Catholic Church. 
and that stuff is not going on in the living parts of the world church. The deep problem mm -hmm. in Rome is that it doesn't understand this. It does not seem to grasp right now that all in Catholicism, as you and I have described it before, really mm -hmm. has a chance to convert the world, while Catholic light is a universal failure. That has got to be mm. front and center at any synod next year on the future of the church. Mm. George, last month, Pope Francis uh, visited Assisi. It was a gathering of about 1,000 young people from 120 countries at a meeting they called uh, on the new economy. Um, also known as the Economy of Francesco, a 2019 initiative created by Pope Francis to address the world's economic problems. Now, the event featured presentations that questioned capitalism and present development models. During his keynote speech at the end of the event, Pope Francis spoke of the economics of plants, uh, an initiative uh, or innovative, rather, theme proposed by some of the young participants. Here's what he said. Plants know how to cooperate with the whole surrounding environment. And even when competing, they're actually cooperating for the good of the ecosystem. We learn from the mildness of plants. Their humility and silence can offer us a different style that we urgently need. Good living is the mysticism that the aboriginal peoples teach us to have with the earth." End quote. Why the focus, do you think, on tribal life uh, and uh, pagan tribal life and not Christian civilization as the ideal for society, where the focus is on God and Christ and his church to solve the problems of the youth uh, in the world? That, that's a good question, Raymond. I, I have to re recall, uh, as you may, my friend Fran Mayer's commentary on that plant uh, discourse in which he said, yeah. there are, yeah, okay, there are good plants and then there are weeds, and the weeds tend to <laughs> choke the good plants. So let's not paint this a picture true. of, you know, benign uh, nature here. Uh, yeah. this, this appeal to a kind of uh, Gaia worship is really misplaced, it seems to me. Yes, we are called to be stewards of the environment. Yes, rubbishing the environment is a bad thing to do. But so is providing jobs for people. So is tilling the earth so that the earth provides abundance for people. Uh, you know, the Holy Father always talks about, you know, somebody told him that if all arms sales were stopped, uh, everybody in the world would be fed. The problem with feeding the world today is corrupt governments in the third world. It's not the unavailability of food. Mm. The Green Revolution has made food abundant throughout the world for the first time in human history. Let's get the bad guys correctly identified here and stop this business about appealing to what are essentially uh, irreligious concepts of nature and its ultimate benignity. In your book, you reference the battle, uh, George, and I think correctly, over the uh, proper interpretation of the council waged by theological reformers who disagreed with whether its teaching constituted a rupture with tradition. Today, as the Church continues this two-year synodal uh, evolution uh, accompaniment, the battle lines have shifted and the reformers seem to be seeking to modify church discipline and really calling for an entirely new model of the church. Your thoughts on where we are now, where this is headed? I'm not sure where it's headed, Raymond, but I was in Rome the last week of August, spoke to a number of churchmen from the third world, including some of the new cardinals, and they are simply uninterested in the German agenda for the church or the kind of synodal discussion that you referenced from Cardinal Grech uh, a few moments ago. They're just not interested in this. They are about the business of the new evangelization. And I think mm -hmm. there's going to be a great surprise uh, if and when this synod gathers in Rome next October at the lack of interest in replicating the German catastrophe among the rest of the world church. And perhaps the Germans are going to be the most surprised. Yeah. 
it, it, it strikes me as sort of a dime store of Vatican III, George. I mean, the way it's constructed, the obvious, you know, uh, trial balloons sent out, uh, and the selection of who is running this agenda. But uh, like you, when you talk, when I talk to cardinals, when I talk to people who, who are going to have to sit there and listen to this, they don't seem to be terribly on board with this agenda. The, the single biggest problem that needs to be addressed between now and next October is the process of that synod. As it is presently proposed, there will be no votes by the participating bishops. There will be, there will be lots of discussion that is then summarized, presumably by people carefully chosen by the synod general secretariat and Cardinal Grech. Those summaries will then be given to the pope, who will then do whatever he pleases. This is not synodality in any meaningful sense of the term. Uh, so mm -hmm. that process really needs to be reexamined, and above all, those bishops are going to be, have to be allowed to vote on propositions, which are the normal mm -hmm. way a synod assembly makes its judgments known. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, but the, I, I have to say, after reading your book, George, and it, I think it's important for people to read it now, because Vatican II is being invoked as uh, the reason and the cause for this synodality we're seeing underway. And it, it, just as, as we end here, do you see a link here between this process and what Vatican II was calling for? Uh, not really, Raymond. Um, it, it, it always takes the Church a hundred years to digest the meaning of, of an ecumenical council. We're still in the middle, in the midst of digesting the meaning of Vatican II. Uh, to create a global process which suggests that everything is up for grabs in the church, which was surely not John mm -hmm. the 23rd's idea or the council's idea, mm -hmm. seems to me just a distraction from getting on with the implementation of the authentic Second Vatican Council. Mm. Yeah, it also, I think, preys on the ignorance of Catholics, because they don't have time to read these documents, but hopefully they'll pick up your book, George, uh, To Sanctify the World, The Vital Legacy of Vatican II by George Weigel is available now at bookstores everywhere and online, including EWTN's religious catalog. Uh, the timing could not be better, George, uh, considering how Vatican II is in the air again and, uh, you know, on every top of everyone's minds in Rome, certainly. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you.